please welcome to the stage Grocery Shop's SVP of Content, Christina Gustafson, for a presentation on the Grocery Zeitgeist. Welcome and thank you again for joining us um, for the second day of Grocery Shop. I uh, wanted to start off by telling a little story. Um, when I was training for the New York City Marathon a couple of years ago, I was absolutely obsessed with finishing in under four hours. Don't know if anyone here in the audience has trained for a marathon, but you get these goals in your head and, and you, you work toward them even if sometimes they aren't the most logical. So I did uphill training runs to build my leg strength, took indoor treadmill classes to try to get faster, and I never missed a scheduled run. The problem was, I became so focused on my day-to-day -day training schedule that I failed to see the bigger picture, finishing the race. So after hundreds of miles and countless hours of running, I had to withdraw hours before the race when I injured my Achilles. It was an injury that easily would have been prevented if I had taken a step back, listened to my body, and focused on the big picture. Over the past 18 months, you may have found yourselves in a similar position. You've needed to prioritize the day-to-day -day needs of the business to meet fast-changing consumer demands and keep your employees safe. And while you've certainly been aware of the transformation happening all around you, you may not have had that chance to take a step back and think about the big picture and how all these changes will transform the industry in the long term. So today, we're going to take that step back. I'm going to talk you through four forces of change that will drive the industry and in its next phase of growth. Society, consumer, the economy, and technology. First, let's take a look at the force that's undergone some of the most dramatic changes over the past 18 months. Society. We'll start with the changing U.S. population. The pandemic baby bust has officially arrived. The birth rate plummeted 8% in December, which marked nine months after the start of the lockdown. This trend's continued into the new year, meaning 2021 could be the first year on record that the country's population shrinks. The stress of COVID-19 is partly to blame, with one in five U.S. women between the ages of 33 and 40 saying the pandemic made them decide not to have an additional child or any children at all. But it's not an isolated incident. U.S. population growth has been trending lower for decades due to an increase in college-educated women, who now outnumber college-educated men, the rising cost of childcare, and memories of the Great Recession. At the same time, 10,000 people turn 65 in the U.S. every day. These converging trends won't just mean that consumer products companies will sell fewer baby diapers and more adult diapers. They'll also need to incorporate technologies and services that cater to maturing or elderly consumers. For example, in Portugal, Sonai is testing magnifying glasses that affix to their shopping carts. Senior hours that retailers introduced during the pandemic are a great example of how they can cater to the elderly population. But there's room to take this concept further. When my parents placed their first online grocery order during the pandemic, we hopped on a Zoom call so I could show them the ropes. They were pretty overwhelmed. <laughs> but the second time that they placed an online order, they only needed to ask a couple of questions along the way. Fast forward to today, and they're placing their entire grocery order online, week in and week out. I'd like to think it's because I'm a fantastic teacher, but in reality, there's nothing stopping retailers from helping older shoppers like my parents build that first critical basket, setting them up to be loyal online customers. The growing minority population is another opportunity for brands and retailers. The majority of the population under age 18 is now people of color, 
And by 2045, the white population will be the minority. Non-white race and ethnic groups accounted for all of the country's population gains over the past decade, as all 50 states experienced growth from populations of people of color. Over that same time frame, 35 states saw their white population shrink. As the population becomes more diverse, antiquated ways of marketing and selling foods need to be reimagined. For example, what role does an ethnic food aisle play in a diverse market like California, New York, Illinois, or Pennsylvania? Meanwhile, companies that cater to Asian and Hispanic shoppers are thriving, threatening traditional grocers who fail to modernize their assortments. As for trends in where the overall population lives in shops, the major exodus from cities looks to have been overstated. In reality, the majority of wealthy people who left major cities during the first year of the pandemic moved to more suburban areas within the same metropolitan area, giving them access to city life but with a bit more closet space. As more consumers live and work slightly farther from the city center, their spending will follow suit. That means even as retailers open stores in urban locations, they should also invest in upgrading their existing suburban locations, a strategy that's been key to Target's success already. Turning to the workplace, early findings show that 20% of full workdays will be done from home post-pandemic, compared with just 5% before. That'll impact everything from what they wear to what they'll eat. The workforce has also undergone a complete transformation, a trend that's becoming even more evident in people's growing expectations of their employer. Unhappy workers are leaving their employers in droves. The resignation rate remains near a record high that was hit back in April, and over 40% of the global workforce says they're likely to consider leaving their employer within the next year. Many of these workers are reevaluating what they want out of life and dealing with burnout. Now, we'll talk more about burnout in a couple of minutes, but suffice it to say that leaders who don't prioritize their employees' well-being risk draining their leadership pipeline, losing institutional memory, and eroding their corporate culture. A shakeup in the corporate workforce also means increased competition for your business. According to the Census Bureau, U.S. small business creation increased 24% last year, hitting its highest total on record, more than 4.4 million. Many of these businesses were focused squarely on the consumer. Direct-to-consumer food and beverage startups recorded a 68% increase in Cedar Angel deals in 2020 versus the prior year. This boom in entrepreneurship means your former employees and coworkers could very well be out there building the next billion-dollar brand. Amid all these societal changes, brands and retailers have a responsibility to do right for their employees. The pandemic contributed to a rapid acceleration of the mental health crisis, with four in 10 adults acknowledging symptoms of anxiety and depression. That's four times higher than before the pandemic. It's imperative that companies create policies to alleviate these feelings among their employees. It's particularly true when you think about recruiting and retaining younger workers who expect more from their employers than prior generations, things like diverse cultures, flexible scheduling, and more and more. Companies, though, need to be proactive and thoughtful about what these policies are. Mental well-being days have taken off in popularity, but they do little to solve the problems of workers who still face the same deadlines and workload, meaning they simply ship their work into the night or the weekend. A respected member of the Shop Talk Advisory Board recently told me that mental well-being days can and have worked at her company. But she said their success hinges on senior leaders being the first to put down their phones and stop sending emails and aligning these days with non-deadline periods when employees can truly check out. During the pandemic, you all came together to share best practices for keeping your employees and customers safe, like Kroger, which shared its blueprint for business that included tips to help others in the industry create a safe in-store environment. You may now have an opportunity to band together and make the industry a better place for your workers' overall well-being, all the way from the associate to the corporate level. We're going to shift gears now and examine how the consumer is transforming grocery and CPG. Consumers' definitions of what's healthy is changing, moving beyond just health to overall well-being. It may seem like a subtle shift, but this means that a product as healthy as water is no longer enough. Brands like Smart Water are responding to the shift by launching enhanced products that promise added benefits like boosting your tranquility or clarity. Consumers' growing preference for shopping local is another opportunity for grocery retailers to thrive. More than half of global shoppers say it's more important to shop local than before the pandemic as they look to give back to their local community. 
But we think about localization as more than just shopping local. It spans the entire value chain, from local sourcing and stocking store shelves with regional merchandise, to distinctive store designs that instill a sense of local pride. Localization also includes convenient shopping experiences provided by your local grocer, like curbside pickup or 30-minute delivery. It means providing personalized customer service from a store associate who lives in the community and giving back to that community through local philanthropy. If you attended our session on shopping local earlier, you've also heard how a well-executed localization strategy can boost brand loyalty and retailers' top line. Generational changes are also impacting brands and retailers. Products or messages that were once considered taboo are resonating with a new generation of shoppers who crave authenticity in a way that's distinct from millennials. A great example is how Gen Z is redefining the notion of masculinity. Asian countries like South Korea and Japan have been behind much of the growth in men's cosmetics. But one-third of American men under 30 recently said they'd also consider wearing makeup. This has created new product opportunities for the cosmetics industry, like this men's concealer former Yankee Alex Rodriguez created in partnership with Hims. More traditional companies are buying into this trend too. A rise in same-sex marriages and gender fluidity recently encouraged Tiffany to introduce its first line of men's engagement rings. Still, it's a uniquely challenging time to try to understand consumers. We're witnessing a stark divide in how consumers feel about everything from their financial and mental well-being to their beliefs on masking and vaccinations. As many Americans continue to feel anxious and fearful of infecting themselves or family members, others are excited to be returning to normal activities, celebrations, and events. Companies walk a fine line in marketing to consumers on both ends of the spectrum. Some have even been taken to task for, adding, for airing optimistic ads at the same time infections were rising. Others have played it safe by shifting their messaging to the importance of community and the role they play within it. No matter what approach companies take, though, in order to succeed, they must be driven by purpose. More companies are hiring chief brand officers to ensure every aspect of the business is aligned with the company's values, from marketing to HR to vendor selection. Brands also need to be thoughtful about when it's right to speak up and how to do it in an authentic way. When Delta CEO Ed Bastian spoke out about Georgia's voting rights bill, he admitted it was an issue he initially did not want to take a stance on. But he ultimately decided that he had a responsibility to do so. He explained that because Delta is the largest employer in Atlanta, with the largest base of black employees, the law would disproportionately impact his workforce. The law also went against Delta's core value of bringing people together. While he admitted there's no single framework for determining when to speak up, Brand should consider a similar analysis when deciding which issues to address and how. They also need to make sure they stand behind their values. Like many of you, I was incredibly excited to see Simone Biles return to the mat at the Tokyo Olympics. When she withdrew from the finals, sponsoring Brand Athleta applauded her bravery and supported her decision to prioritize her mental health. Consumers, in turn, applauded Athleta's continued support of Simone, with some telling the brand it had earned their business. It was a visible shift from decades of athlete sponsorship deals being tied to their results, and Athleta came out on top. Of course, we can't talk about brand purpose without mentioning sustainability. 84% of global shoppers say sustainability is important when making purchase decisions, meaning sustainable practices are a business imperative. But inflicting less harm on the environment is no longer enough. The most forward-thinking companies are now looking for ways that they can help the planet. They've shifted their efforts over time from conventional to sustainable to regenerative. That means they're now undertaking efforts to protect and restore the environment, use renewable resources, and source products from suppliers with a shared mission like Whole Foods, which recently announced its Sourced for Good seal to make it easy for shoppers to find responsibly sourced products. We'll finish our look at consumers by examining their increasingly hybrid habits. For decades, spending on groceries and dining out nearly converged, hitting a 50-50 split. Then the pandemic hit, causing a sharp decline in spending on food away from home. I am probably not the best source on this one because I truthfully cannot tell you the last time that I turned on my oven. But research has shown that the majority of consumers plan to continue spending more on groceries, even as others have grown tired of cooking. 
Prepared meals and food service retail may ultimately become the perfect option for the hybrid eater, with 39% of consumers saying they view food service retail as a substitute for both a home-cooked meal and a restaurant meal. Consumers are also adopting a hybrid approach to how they shop and have their orders fulfilled. Data from 8451 shows that during the peak of the pandemic, there was a 500% increase in customers getting their groceries four different ways, in store, through pickup, by delivery, and shipped to their home. The retailers that invest in the technology to connect customer data points across channels and build out a fulfillment infrastructure to support all these variations will be the ones that win. The next force we'll talk about is the economy. We're still in the midst of a global pandemic with an economy that's recovering, but at a slower and shakier pace than some had hoped. Although you wouldn't know it by looking at the S&P 500. Even with the volatility over the past couple of days, the US stock market has been going mostly higher after the initial shock back in 2020 and remains just about 5% off record highs. As you can see, though, consumer sentiment has been a much less consistent story. Consumers' feelings about their finances have ebbed and flowed throughout the recovery. And in the past two months, sentiment has hit its lowest levels of the entire pandemic. The recent expiration of unemployment benefits by nearly two dozen states is also expected to weigh on consumer sentiment and retail sales, as is rampant inflation. Shortages of everything from automobiles to labor are fueling an uneven recovery, sending prices for businesses and consumers higher. Of course, there are positive signals in the economy too, including lower unemployment, a return to economic growth, and a record amount of savings. But these data points only tell part of the story. There are major gaps in how these trends play out depending on consumers' affluence, race, or gender. During the peak of the pandemic, consumers added nearly $4 trillion to their savings. It's an impressive number, but a deeper dive into that data shows the wealthiest consumers accounted for the lion's share of those gains. Households in the top income quintile, which are seen here in purple, accounted for two-thirds of those savings. However, those in the lowest income quintile accounted for less than 2%. We expect these trends to play out in growth of premium products and at discount chains, with products and retailers in the middle getting squeezed. However, it could also lead to a prolonged increase in spending on food at home, as lower-income consumers continue to turn to home cooking as a way to save money. We're also seeing a dramatic gap in the employment recovery based on race and gender. As was the case before the pandemic, the unemployment rate remains persistently higher for black and Hispanic workers, even as it's trended mostly lower across all racial and ethnic groups. And last month, the unemployment rate for black workers actually rose, even as the overall unemployment rate declined. That runs counter to the fact that the economy is experiencing a severe labor shortage, underscoring systemic inequality that predates the pandemic. The employment recovery has also been slower for women creating what some are calling a she-session. Even as hiring is ticked back up, the women's labor participation rate remains at 56.2%. That's down from 57.8% at the start of 2020 and represents a level not previously seen since the 1980s. At the current rate, it'll take women nine years to regain the jobs that they lost in the pandemic. In our recent report on the state of women working in retail, we surveyed over 300 women in our community about their experiences in the workplace. We heard from some of them that they tend to feel over-mentored, but under-sponsored in corporate settings. During times of crisis, companies have been known to ease up on efforts to make their workforce more gender-balanced and diverse. But these numbers show they should be doing the exact opposite. Following an unprecedented period of layoffs and quits, Grocery retailers and CPG companies have a unique opportunity to rebuild their workforce as one that's more representative of the U.S. population and, in turn, their customer base. Finally, I'll briefly touch on the technological changes impacting the industry. I'm going to be very quick here, though, because tomorrow you're going to hear from my colleague Joe Laszlo about all the ways that technology is making grocery shopping faster, more sustainable, smarter, and more automated. But it's also important to take a look at the technology trends we're seeing outside of the grocery industry to identify where there are opportunities for your business in the coming years. Take live stream shopping and social commerce. In the US, these offerings have been mostly limited to categories like fashion and cosmetics. But there are opportunities for the broader grocery industry to get on board. For example, in China, farmers are selling millions of dollars of fruit on TikTok. 
Yes, social commerce in China is 10 times the size of the US market, so I'll admit that this example is a little bit extreme. But perhaps a more relevant one is the Old Spice Barber Shop. This experiential location doubles as a hair salon and content studio, where celebrity barbers can give haircuts and film content for their social media pages. It's easy to see how social commerce could be integrated into this type of experience, or one that's similar and relevant to your business. Think about a gourmet cooking class taught by a celebrity chef using all of your brand's shoppable ingredients. Broader technology innovations like 5G will also have implications for the industry long term, as faster processing speeds provide real-time data and insights that help prevent out of stocks. So to conclude, the past 18 months have been a scramble. But they've also proven how resilient you all are. You've seen what your company and industry can achieve when you're not worried about getting a new product or offering 100% right at launch. You've seen firsthand how quickly new ideas can be brought to market when key stakeholders from each functional unit are included along the way and when multiple layers of approval are eliminated. You've proven to your leadership teams the importance of making digital a core component of your company's strategy. Now's the time to take a step back and reset your long-term lens and think about how society, the consumer, the economy, and technology will shape the industry going forward. The ones who pair that big picture thinking with the pandemic way of working will be the ones that not only survive, but thrive long-term. And just remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint.